Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's World Affairs program, Leadership in Washington, the Legacy of James Baker. I'm Marcos Kunalakis, moderator for today's program, and I'm a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution, and up until recently, the global affairs columnist for the McClatchy chain, uh, but McClatchy has now decided to go all local and has abandoned some of the world reporting that they've done, and, and uh, anyway, I'm on the World Affairs program with you today, and that's, that's a joy and delight. I'm also delighted to introduce Peter Baker and Susan Glasser, speakers for today's program. Peter, Pro, uh, Peter Baker is the chief White House correspondent for the New York Times, a political analyst for MSNBC, and author of Days of Fire and The Breach. Susan Glasser is a staff writer for The New Yorker and author of its weekly Letter from Trump's Washington, as well as a CNN global affairs analyst. The first assi together, their first assignment as a married couple was as Moscow bureau chiefs for The Washington Post, after which they wrote the book Kremlin Rising. Today, they live in Washington, D.C. with their son, and we'll be discussing their newest book, The Man Who Ran Washington, the life and times of James A. Baker III. And uh, since this is the World Affairs program, focus on James, we'll be focusing on James Baker and foreign policy. And by the way, here is their book. Um, make sure to look for it. Uh, they won't be able to sign it today, but um, perhaps they can do a little virtual signature thing uh, as we go through the program, but do look for the book. Um, it's an extensive and uh, well-researched book. Uh, I won't go through the details, but apparently it took 12 years, um, 760 pages. Is that right? Oh, no, no, no. It's like 580 or so. You're, you're counting the footnotes. Don't count the footnotes. Oh, okay. Well, I'm an academic, so I have to count footnotes, you know, <laughs> because that's what, it, what matters. Um, so what an endeavor and, uh, and an amazing book. And, and you really go through the full, uh, the full life of James Baker. And, um, but as I said, because we're, we're the World Affairs program, we're going to take a slice of that very extensive research that you've done and, and look at some of the issues that uh, he dealt with in, uh, in foreign policy. But before we do that, let's talk about the issues of the day. Uh, there is no way to avoid uh, under uh, really COVID because of the fact that we're doing this via Zoom and not on stage in San Francisco or elsewhere. Uh, is a sign that we're all affected by COVID. Um, with this type of reporting that you did, where you've interviewed nearly 200 people, uh, traveled throughout the United States and elsewhere, it, is that type of reporting now something of the past, uh, given our COVID uh, type of life? Yeah, look, well, first of all, Marcus, thank you very much for having us. Thank you to the World Affairs Council of San Francisco for hosting this event. We're thrilled to be with you. We wish we were there in person. We love San Francisco and uh, doing a book tour from our living room is not the same as being with you uh, there on the West Coast. But you know, look, that's, that is the reality of the moment, right? Book tours are done from your living room. Reporting is done via phone and Zoom. Uh, we are making do with what we can, like everybody else, like every other industry. We're optimistic that the vaccine will make it possible to be reporters again in the old fashioned sense, going out and actually seeing, touching, feeling, and not hearing things. But uh, journalism has had to adapt like academia and like everybody else. And how has that been? I mean, uh, you know, certainly in, in areas where uh, journalism has been suffering because of the business model collapse, um, it's harder to get to some of these stories. Uh, it may not be as true in Washington, D.C., where you have such a preponderance of, uh, of reporting resources. Um, but, uh, but how do you see it affecting journalism? Well, certainly, I thank you again, Marcos. I would say certainly when it comes to covering this particular White House, it's been a, a challenge of an actual direct uh, threat to the health uh, of the reporters themselves, as well as to all those uh, who work there. Uh, in fact, uh, Peter's colleague uh, at the New York Times, two of his colleagues uh, got COVID as a result of their work covering the White House. And after that, uh, both the New York Times and the Washington Post decided for, as far as we can tell, the first time ever not to travel with President Trump in the traveling uh, press pool because of the dangers uh, to their own reporters and photographer safety. And, you know, this is something completely unprecedented. Obviously, there are uh, many data points 
fast, uh, you know, we're dealing with not just a disruptive, but a, you know, sort of a, a, a uniquely disruptive presidency. But, you know, one little data point does concern the journalism and uh, the fact that, you know, basic public health measures uh, have not been followed by the White House in the course of the nine months. And it is amazingly enough, nine months already that we've been going through this pandemic. Uh, so it's, it's one of the ways in which uh, uh, sometimes we journalists live two distant lives from those of the, the lives of the people that we cover, trying to understand what's happening in the country. But in this particular case, uh, you know, there is a convergence. Same thing as it happened at the U.S. Capitol, by the way, where they uh, have had enormous like kind of back and forth. And you still to the day have many uh, uh, members of Congress, Republican members of Congress, who refuse to wear masks and to protect the safety, uh, not only of the fellow members of Congress, but uh, their staff, the staff who stops the Capitol, security, and the journalists. So it's actually been uh, interesting to see how that has, uh, you know, it's not just an abstract policy debate. Right. Well, uh, speaking of COVID uh, and the subject of your book, I understand that, um, that James Baker actually uh, caught COVID as well. Is that right? He did, yeah. Last summer, both uh, Jim Baker and his wife, Susan Baker, got COVID. Uh, Jim Baker has just turned 90 this year. And, you know, look, it was, a, it was a wallop. He said it really knocked him flat. He couldn't get out of bed for five days straight, and it really uh, knocked the socks out. Now, they were lucky. They didn't have to go to the hospital. They never had to get any kind of treatment in the way that other people have. Uh, and they did recover. And, you know, he, uh, Baker is such a strong horse that, uh, you know, literally within days of, um, uh, literally within days of, uh, sorry about that. That's, uh, that's the, our, our, our research assistant, Ellie. Uh, Quite all right. This is the Zoom reality that we're all facing. Reality, yeah. Yes, men at the door and dogs who are barking at them. Exactly. Literally within days of, of, uh, Baker getting better. He went uh, on a hunting expedition uh, to hunt elk with his son. So that's, you know, what he told everybody was, it's a good thing I got, I got it when I was 90 rather than when I was really old. Yeah, right. Well, speaking of really old, you know, I, I uh, was on a Zoom with him uh, just last week because the former Secretary of State George Shultz uh, this weekend celebrated his 100th anniversary. And so he was part of a uh, of a commemorative uh, meeting of, of multiple members, including Henry Kissinger and others that was uh, held by the Hoover Institution. So yeah, he is relatively young uh, as a former Secretary of State. <laughs> that particular group he might be, yeah, with Kissinger and uh, Schultz, you're right. Yeah, that's right, it was quite a collection. And, uh, uh, but I think uh, he was the only one who'd had COVID. You know, um, I, to, as we work our way into sort of discussing foreign policy, one of the things that I noted uh, is that um, as I was thinking about Baker and, and having and reading through your book, um, was of course that he was a chief of staff, and and I started thinking about this and noticed that he wasn't, of course, the first uh, or the last chief of staff to actually move from that position into a cabinet position over time. I mean, I thought about, and I'm sure there are probably more, but aside from Baker, there was Panetta, there was Cheney, there was Rumsfeld, and now, of course, McDonough uh, is, uh, is going to be a part of um, the staff. What, what is it about chiefs of staff, maybe that you have an insight into in, there in Washington, D.C., that then gives them either the inside track or maybe the ability to conduct and, and perform a cabinet level position? Well, look, I think it's a great question, and forgive the interruption. Uh, Washington being a small village, that was actually a former very senior White House official who was coming by with a copy of our book and he wanted us to talk. <laughs> um, uh, look. No wonder your dog was barking. Yeah. She <laughs> likes like to protect us. It's yeah. Washington. <laughs> right. She's equal opportunity, whether it's a FedEx person or a, a government official. <laughs> um, look. The thing is that's interesting about Jim Baker is that he was actually the only man ever to twice be a chief of staff for two different presidents, both for Ronald Reagan and for George Herbert Walker Bush. Baker is widely considered, I would say, uh, by people in both parties, Democrats and Republicans, to be kind of the gold standard for what it means to be a chief of staff. And I think what people mean by that is uh, his ability uh, to really be the central power behind the scenes in an administration, uh, right? You know, that's not the job where you're in front of the press every day. Although uh, one of the reasons Baker was so good at being White House Chief of Staff was that he understood uh, the role that the media played 
in uh, determining the success or failure of a presidency. And he was very upfront about that being a priority uh, in terms of how he organized the White House. But he had an unparalleled understanding in that Reagan White House of how to operate and use the machinery of government. Uh, and that was certainly one of the reasons why he was able to prevail over his internal rivals. And that Reagan White House, I should say, was absolutely a faction-ridden, intrigue-filled uh, nightmare. You know, it was filled with backstabbing. And, you know, Peter got a text from a former uh, Trump official uh, when the book came out saying, you know, that Reagan White House, it sounds an awful lot like our White House, except that Jim Baker was so extremely competent. Uh, and, you know, gee, we could have used some of that Baker uh, uh, around there. But, you know, that's a long way of saying that Baker uh, certainly used his time at the top of Reagan's White House to understand, you know, well, what are other platforms I might like in Washington or what would I be good at doing, right? And he observed up close the functioning of the town. But he also understood that in Washington, even if you're the greatest staffer of all time, and you know, some people would say Jim Big was the greatest staffer of all time, uh, you're still a staffer and your identity and your power derives uh, from the guy who's in the front of all those pictures. And I think he yearned throughout his career as many of his successors have to be a principal in his own right. Principal is sort of Washington speak for uh, you know, the guy at the center of the action. And I think that you know, Baker in particular did not like the reputation of being a political handler uh, that had accompanied his rise in national politics. He was eager to be seen much more as a statesman, to be seen as a doer in his own right. And so I think that explains part of the alert for the very talented people like Leon Panetta and uh, Dennis McDonough who served in different roles in Washington uh, is that desire to be seen as a principal in their own right. And so does that then, uh, you know, so inside track, the desire to be it, does it make them then a uh, good or uh, average uh, cabinet member? Uh, is there anything that they've gained in the process that, that gives them uh, an edge in, within the cabinet? Well, it can, obviously. I mean, it depends. Baker obviously used his knowledge of how the gears turned in order to, 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 to operate them from outside the building in a way that very few people are able to you understand i think having been chief of staff as susan said where all the all the bodies are buried where all the you know how all the pieces fit together not everybody is successful al Haig had been a chief of staff under nixon and was a successful chief of staff help you know end the uh, the, the, the the watergate uh, presidency in a, in a in a in a peaceful way uh but was a terrible cabinet secretary really got it into his head that he had you know he'd been basically Co, you know, shadow president under Nixon and felt like he should be that under Reagan. And he, he, that wasn't welcomed by, among others, Jim Baker. So it, it kind of depends on the person, I think. Yeah. Well, and I, I must add as well that uh, it, there is a certain irony in Baker yearning to escape the White House and become a cabinet member because, in fact, he understood, and, and I think subsequently most people understand, that actually being a cabinet member sounds really grand, but isn't necessarily all that. Now, uh, I, there is an exception, I would say, for the two cabinet jobs that Baker sought and, and had, which is Treasury Secretary and Secretary of State, which are, you know, among the most senior positions in the U.S. But uh, generally speaking, Baker understood as chief of staff in the White House that he had more power day to day than any member of the cabinet and even arguably than his best friend, uh, the man who was responsible for him entering politics in the first place, George Herbert Walker Bush, though he was vice president. Uh, you know, it was, uh, I guess, uh, 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 Vice President Garner back in FDR times who said it ain't worth a bucket of warm spit. And, uh, you know, certainly in a practical sense, Baker knew that being in the cabinet wasn't necessarily uh, all that grand. Uh, but then again, it looks really good on the resume. Yeah, it's a good resume builder. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll see what happens with Vice President Kamala Harris and uh, to what degree uh, that warm bucket of spit uh, is able to uh, evolve into maybe a uh, into something much more valuable. Um, let's move to some of the foreign affairs questions, because, as you say, you know, chief of staff, treasury secretary, but really, um, Secretary of State, where he's running his own shop, has his own plane, uh, is running around the world and is doing the types of things that he was so successfully did in Washington, D.C., which was cutting deals and, and meeting with principals and being able to uh, uh, have these various factions come together. Uh, and he's now going to try and assert this 
uh, on the world and try to apply this on a much grander stage. And yet uh, you look at what happened during his watch, and I'm going to start with China, and um, that wasn't necessarily the right thing to do in terms of um, how to confront the Tiananmen Square massacre and, and, and in many ways the appeasement that seemed to follow as a result of that, uh, leading to and setting forth perhaps this path to a rising power that is now, uh, if not a peer competitor to the United States, certainly challenging uh, the primacy of the United States. How did he, as you spent so much time with him, how did he reflect on his time in China and, and the work that he did uh, with the leadership back then? Yeah, I think China is a great example of sort of the cold calculation that Jim Baker made when he was in high positions of power. This, so this book, for instance, I mean, we say this is a study of power rather than a celebration of it. So you can you can admire or you can, you can uh, decide that he didn't do the right thing, but what was fascinating was to watch how he worked, right? And he made the calculation, as did Bush, that the relationship with China was too important to the United States to allow the Tiananmen Human Rights Massacre to throw it completely off track. Now, again, this is a, a, a cold you know, view of the world in which basically hundreds of lives being killed, uh, as outraged as you might be, uh, you, you need to restrain your sense of, of outrage in order to maintain the relationship in his view. And so they, Bush and Baker, for, you know, they put sanctions on, they cut off ties, mainly in order to keep Congress from doing something worse. Yeah. And then Bush secretly sent Brent Scowcroft to tell the Chinese, look, you have to do something to make this right. We've, we've got this domestic audience if you want to keep the relationship on track. Now, Baker understood that Bush was, as he liked to put it, the China desk officer in the Bush administration, because he had served, of course, as envoy in Beijing. And so he kind of took that hands-off approach anyway, uh, in order to let Bush take the lead. There was no point in trying to compete with his friend, the president, on an issue that the president knew so much better than he did anyway. So his sort of hands-off approach was also a, a function of his calculation internally about which issues he should focus on. He focused instead on mainly Europe, Soviet Union, and the Middle East. But I think your point, though, about where China then went, he did say recently to us in, in, a, in a, one of these events we've, dealt, we've done with him that the calculation they made at that time, broadly speaking, that if they brought China into the economic global uh, you know, network, right, through the WTO and other mechanisms, that eventually that economic pressure would lead to demo, uh, democratic reforms in China, and that that thesis has now been proven a failure, and that he thinks it is time, in fact, for the United States to be tougher with China uh, than it had been in his era. Yeah, and I think in his defense, I think that really was the understanding uh, writ large was that engagement was the way to bring China into this community of nations, become a responsible stakeholder and the like. Um, is that the extent to his reflections? Just, uh, I mean, any sort of understanding that maybe if if there were any counterfactual understandings, if he had, if they'd done something much more assertive uh, to cut them off to increase sanctions that there might have been a, a different outcome or a different level of leverage over the internal uh, evolution because at the time China was still a relatively weak uh, state. You know, look, we did uh, dozens of hours of interviews with Jim Baker as part of this book. He was extremely cooperative with us. He also wrote two of his own memoirs. Um, one thing I can say for sure about Baker is that he is not a man given to second guessing uh, or- uh, He doesn't <laughs> look, do regret. He doesn't do regret, uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, he just, um, uh, you know, even uh, on, on China, it was one of the rare instances where he allowed any sort of questioning uh, about their strategy. And remember, this was, you know, three decades ago. Yes. Uh, so arguably, you can look at it either as a success in the sense that it lasted, uh, you know, for several decades, uh, or uh, as, as not the right way to go. The, the thing that that episode told me, I think, about Baker is uh, has to do with his remarkable penchant throughout his career in Washington, not just as Secretary of State, uh, for mostly avoiding being uh, in the wrong place at the wrong time, or at least being blamed for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, and uh, I don't think that people think uh, the Bush administration covered itself in glory with how it handled Tiananmen Square. And most people associate that more directly with Bush himself and Scowcroft than with Baker. And, uh, you know, Barbara Bush, for one, often thought that uh, that Baker had a little bit of a vanishing act when it came to tough things that the administration uh, 
was in for criticism on. And, you know, look, any career uh, that's seen as successful as Baker's, um, uh, some of that is luck and some of it is the skill in, in avoiding blame. I would add there was tension inside. I mean, like inside even Baker's yeah. own team, Margaret Tutwiler, who was very, very close to him as his right hand person when it came to dealing with the outside world, was just absolutely, uh, you know, aghast at what had happened in, in Beijing. And she watched these pictures and she was horrified and she kept pressing on Baker. Why aren't you doing more? Why aren't you saying more? Why aren't you speaking out? And, and he kept basically pushing her off saying, that's not what we're doing here. And he was very cold eyed about it. Again, it was sort of a, a very uh, unsentimental approach. And she would say now today, years and years later, that he was probably right. He wasn't an emotional kind of person, he didn't respond emotionally to events as horrific as those events were. But um, it's, it's, uh, it, takes a real, it takes a real different kind of cat, I think, to kind of uh, not respond to such a, a terrible or, uh, event with a more uh, you know, personal sense of outrage. Yeah, by the way, I, I uh, found that section of the book quite interesting. You know, I, I made sure to dig into it and you, and throughout the book, but also in this uh, section, you, you have such wonderful detail, um, not just what they were having in their meals, but also just conversations that were held. You, you go through this one example of Tutwiler and Baker um, arguing about whether she would go out and speak Mm -hmm. uh, to the press corps and, uh, and her refusing to because of her outrage at the time. And it's just a, it's a marvelous exchange with emphasis and, and you really feel as if you're in the room. And I, and I have to say that that's true throughout the book, through all the sections that I've read so far. And, uh, and really congratulations. It shows that you've put in the time, you've had the access and, uh, and that you've been able to really think about, uh, this, this, uh, study in power, um, in, uh, in a very uh, deep and, and, and significant way. So thank you for that. Um, but one of the things, that, and, and this is not now going to focus strictly on China. Oh, I should say one more thing. If uh, our audience wants to ask questions, there's a Q&A question here. We'll, I'll look through it uh, during the course of this and, and uh, pop into whatever questions you might have. Um, it, it seems as though uh, what, what happened in China, and, and, and I think this will also seem to be the case when we talk about Russia or the Soviet Union and then Eastern Europe, that there's this uh, uh, understanding on Baker's part that he needs to manage through the problem rather than have sort of a vision of what it is that an outcome should be. Uh, even though the outcome should be favorable to the United States, it's, there is no sort of understanding, at least from my reading and from my experience of the man, that there was sort of an, a, 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 well, as I say, a vision of what, of what an outcome should be. Is that, is that how you saw his, uh, his character and his approach? Well, look, I think as Secretary of State, uh, you know, and the same thing could be said to apply more broadly to the Bush presidency. Obviously, Bush himself was not seen as a visionary politician. There was that famous, uh, you know, uh, news we cover about the lack of a vision thing. Yeah. Um, you know, but... Uh, Baker shared that, I would say, with Bush to a certain extent. I mean, they were, you know, old fashioned conservatives in the sense of uh, not just limited government, uh, but they weren't revolutionaries. Uh, they were uh, conservatives because they were products and members of an establishment, uh, uh, one who saw a certain uh, appeal to old fashioned values, although to a certain extent, you know, they were also representatives of a, a new kind of Republican party. Remember George Bush was not his father, you know, was the waspy Senator from Connecticut Prescott Bush. George Bush, uh, right, had gone off, he'd been a World War II hero, had gone off to Texas to seek his fortune in the oil fields. That's how he met uh, uh, his friend Jim Baker and the country club tennis courts of Houston. Uh, and, you know, he was sort of a, a part of the new South, a business person, not dug into the old Southern establishment at a time when uh, there was this fundamental transformation going on uh, in the Sun Belt towards the Republican Party. Uh, Bush was largely uh, uh, in favor of some things that you don't associate with Republicans today, things like civil rights and uh, environmentalism even. Uh, and, uh, you know, neither was in any way, uh, you know, a leftist or a progressive, but by the standards of their party and what their party subsequently became, uh, they were. And why do I say that? Because these were revolutionary times in the world. Uh, and especially when Jim Baker became Secretary of State. So he didn't have some kind of guiding principle of the world. He wasn't Henry Kissinger. He hadn't spent 
decades uh, formulating an academic theory of uh, international relations. He didn't uh, preach to you about the Treaty of Westphalia and the, you know, the, the nation state. Uh, however, uh, it turned out that he was a, uh, a, a superb crisis manager at a time when the crisis found him, right? So he didn't need to be looking for things to do as Secretary of State. He was managing a world at one of its hinge points, and he was very, very good at that. Number two, uh, this, I think, uh, ingrained bias towards stability uh, in a sense uh, that uh, working in concert uh, uh, and being a natural diplomat, which Baker was and Bush was too, to a large extent, those were exactly, I think, the things that ended up being required in terms of dealing with the Soviet Union that was unraveling far more rapidly than, than any of them anticipated. And that's the, that's the other thing I would, I would note in terms of his approach overall to this. Baker was extremely, um, uh, maybe not strategic in the sense of like, uh, international relations is a chessboard and I'm moving uh, the US from here to there because I have a vision of where I want it to end up being. But he was very strategic in terms of uh, uh, how he approached any of the many jobs he had, whether that was running a presidential campaign or uh, this, the State Department. And he would really focus on, you know, what are the one or two or three things. And the unraveling of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, that was the one big thing. And he understood that. And so he was focused on that much more so than on China or other issues, even important ones like this was the period of the, the uh, unraveling of the apartheid state uh, and the end of uh, the, the white regime in South Africa. But he didn't focus on that, focused on the Soviet Union. And so that's a kind of vision and also a vision that he and Bush had for the post-Cold War international order based on principles of liberal internationalism uh, that they both saw was their opportunity and their bid for history, uh, was to construct what that world order would be after the Cold War. Right. And so what was then referred to as the New World Order was something that was basically one of international liberalism, the kind of thing that Francis Fukuyama, who I, you point out in your book, was uh, on staff at, uh, at National Security at the time, um, was, was promoting and, and sort of laying the, uh, the framework for uh, and, and, you know, defining in many ways. Uh, and this was something that they then aligned with. But one of the things that also seemed quite clear is, as you say, you know, his ability to manage through crisis, uh, a big part of that was um, really personality focused. It's, it almost seems like it was always managing up, dealing with the principles in many of these cases and not necessarily responding to the voices on the street or the or the activity in the popular activity and and i'm just curious if that upbringing that you describe and that and that professional experience that he'd had had uh, also created the inability to attune himself to what was in fact happening at a very popular level in a very in a very incendiary way um, in those in those revolutionary times, uh, and instead choosing to have the very personal one to one with uh, Edward Shevardnadze, for instance, or someone else, is that something that came across in your in your read of him? Yeah, I think it's a great insight. I think you're right about that. Look, he, he, for those who don't know him, he is from a patrician arist, uh, you know, Houston astrot. He is from Houston aristocracy. He is a patrician. Uh, born. He is the fourth man named James Addison Baker, and the, the family had a long tradition of public service, but not politics. And in fact, the one time when Jim Baker runs for office as Texas Attorney General in 1978, uh, he's just not a backslapper. He's not a baby kisser. He goes straight through the Texas Fair without stopping to shake anybody's hand and finds the county judge in the back tent and starts talking to him because he's the power broker. And see, that's what, how Baker uh, approached his time at the top. It was as a power broker and a power player, not as a populist, not as a, you know, person who's in the streets. He was not somebody who was going to encourage the revolution, as Susan said, in the streets. He was the one who was dealing, as you pointed out correctly, with Shevard Nazi, with Gorbachev, with, uh, you know, the Israeli prime minister and the Egyptian president and so forth. And that was how he saw business getting done. And if, you know, he was not sympathetic to, he wasn't hostile to, but he wasn't sympathetic to popular uprisings, that just, he was just trying to figure out how to manage them and how to make sure that they ended in a way that worked well for the United States. Right. 
Um, so let's talk a bit about the Soviet Union. Uh, both you and I have uh, spent time, well, you weren't in the Soviet Union. I was there, but uh, we were both in Russia. We were both in Moscow. Uh, you much longer than I. And um, this was, a, this was a, a topic that he was focused on, as you say, Susan. And it was something that uh, was very dynamic and, and unpredictable. And, um, and I recall, for instance, uh, working on a story uh, where uh, the Gorbachev had come to the Ministrani, the Ministerstvo Ministrani Deal, the foreign ministry, and, and uh, talked about um, how George Bush had called him and warned him about a potential overthrow. Uh, so what that told me was that, and of course, the bet was made, that the bet was made that Gorbachev would be the person that uh, Bush and Baker would be supportive of throughout this transition, and that maintaining stability was much more important than seeing a dramatic change in the Soviet Union. Um, it was uh, it looked upon today as uh, a moment uh, that uh, perhaps also set a course that eventually allowed uh, Putin to arise because not only was he supporting the senior leadership, uh, the senior communist leadership at the time, but once that change had occurred, there seemed to be an, a, a clear lack of support for economic support and otherwise technical support for the budding Russian democracy and new capitalism. Um, how does he look at that period and how does he reflect upon that? Well, I think you're exactly right uh, uh, that there was a bet that was made uh, and, a, and a calculation embedded in what Baker and Bush were doing uh, in terms of their policy toward the Soviet Union. And it really was uh, to invest in Gorbachev. And uh, you mentioned Edward Shevardnadze, the Soviet foreign minister, Gorbachev's confidant, his fellow reformer inside the Palo Politburo at the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, Baker became extremely inclusive. They had a relationship unlike that between any Soviet foreign minister uh, and any U.S. Uh, Secretary of State. Baker even invited Shevardnadze to go fly fishing with him in Wyoming, where Baker has a ranch. Uh, uh, Shevardnadze reciprocated with a trip to Lake Baikal. And, you know, they really, actually, Baker uh, found that both Gorbachev and Shevardnadze were confiding in him uh, at a time when there were enemies within, when they, there was extreme instability both inside the government, where the hardliners uh, were, were clearly gunning for the two of them, uh, as well as uh, uh, with the reformers. And the break with Boris Yeltsin, uh, of course, was ultimately... Uh, the thing as much as the attacks by the hardliners and the, and the coup that resulted that ultimately drove Gorbachev from power. Interestingly, there was a critique at the time that you were there, uh, including by uh, State Department officials. Uh, you know, we have a, a friend uh, who was stationed in Moscow at the time. Many of them were very critical of Baker and Bush. They felt that Baker and Bush were slow to understand, uh, you know, the, uh, the rise of small d democracy in the form of reformers like Boris Yeltsin, that they were too cautious, that they had made a bet on Gorbachev uh, and successful reform of the Soviet Union, but these people were probably faster to see that the Soviet Union itself was doomed. Uh, and then this fight, by the way, played out in Washington as well. You had our own version of hardliners, uh, you know, inside the Republican Party, inside the Pentagon. Uh, Dick Cheney at that time was the defense secretary, far more likely to want to do whatever he could to break up uh, and just destroy the Soviet Union than Baker and Bush, who were looking uh, uh, for as soft of a soft landing as they could, not because they liked the Soviet Union, but because I would say their bias was in favor of stability. And in fact, you know, you think back to that incredible day uh, in November of 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell, I was still in college, not covering this. Uh, but you know, what happens? Uh, it, first of all, it's a surprise to the US government, including to Jim Baker, his own experts at the State Department uh, had, had advised him in a memo that it was a pipe dream uh, and fantasy as, as recently as a few months earlier. Uh, it happens, he rushes over to the White House. Uh, they watch the TV in you know, awe as, as all the rest of us were. Uh, and then what happens? They, they come in, the press pool comes in, and Bush says, essentially, not going to dance on the wall, not going to do it, not going to spike the football. And this became a very memorable moment. He was rightly uh, grilled, I believe, by Leslie Stoll, said, you know, where's the emotion here? I mean, these people are becoming free. And uh, it, it told you something 
real uh, about the dispassionate way in which they looked at it and also the bet that they had made. Uh, but, you know, we can talk more, Peter can talk more about, you know, what happened in subsequent years. It really was after uh, Baker was gone from the State Department and after the Bush presidency, uh, you know, that you saw the tumult uh, of the 1990s and that some of the, the failures to create quickly enough a, a functioning market economy and a functioning small d democracy in Russia that, uh, you know, arguably were, were key reasons why Vladimir Putin uh, and a much more authoritarian Russia returned uh, only a decade after these incredible events. Right. Yeah, there's a talk. There's talk at the time, of course. Should there be a Marshall Plan for the old Soviet yeah. Union? They were collapsing. Their economy was in tatters. People were losing their their livelihoods. They didn't know how to adapt to uh, a capitalistic uh, economy so quickly. And Baker made a half-hearted effort, I think, to get at least some funding to help them out. But the, he found it really, uh, you know, found nothing but uh, big walls in front of them. And, and his argument today is, look, there was no domestic constituency for this. The reason why the original Marshall Plan worked was because there was a domestic constituency for uh, countering what they saw as a threat, which is the threat in Europe posed by the Soviet Union. Once your enemy is collapsed, there's no threat. And therefore, why do you want to spend your money on a former enemy? It was also a time of, of inward looking in the United States, right? We just won the Cold War, but we had a recession at home. Why would we talk about spending money there when we need to figure out stuff here? And so Baker would tell you, look, it's just a matter of politics. It was unrealistic at that time to do it. And he's not necessarily wrong about that, but they didn't make a very hard effort to, to try either. And it, you know, it's uh, the other factor they would say is, look, a lot of the money that had gone into the Soviet Union at that time just simply disappeared under, you know, into rat holes. And we no idea where it went. It was a very corrupt time, all of which is true. But the problem is, as you know, and what Susan saw when she and I were there was that in the 90s, that things were so bad for many Russians that the very notion of capitalism, the very notion of democracy were corrupted in their minds. To many Russians, by the time we got there at the end of 2000 and when Putin was coming to power, they associate what we saw as the Western system with collapse and, and the loss of life savings and corruption and crony capitalism. And at that point, it was discredited, which allows for a ladder of Putin to rise. Yeah. Uh, well, it's interesting, you know, and I think that it's, it's uh, certainly all those arguments are credible. And, um, but, you know, what I've found in my few years, and I'm a little older than you, Susan, I was, uh, I was at the Berlin Wall uh, just the day after it fell, and uh, I was working for Newsweek in Rome just prior, and then uh, flew wow. up immediately once it, uh, well, flew up to Munich and then drove through Eastern Europe to East Germany to get up to Berlin that day. Mm -hmm. um, but that um, there are these moments uh, unique moments, whether they be Tiananmen Square or the Berlin Wall fall or any of these other moments. And while you can react as Baker did and Bush did in a very cool headed and rational way to manage the crisis of the moment, it's also a moment when you can set things in motion for the future and, and really decide that you can make more than one bet uh, and, and try to, to do that. And, and if there were criticisms from my colleagues at the time, it was not making enough of a bet on a future that could also evolve, that could be much more um, favorable towards the United States, but also bringing the, the new nation into uh, uh, the community of capitalist, uh, new capitalist structures, despite the corruptions and, the, and all of the problems of the past. But, uh, you know, those were the decisions that they made, and that was the, that was the way that they approached things. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, I, I, I was going to say the one thing that I think is sort of missing from this account, though, is that probably the, the biggest accomplishment of Baker's tenure as Secretary of State, uh, you know, he wasn't looking at that time, uh, you know, 30 years down the road. What he did over the subsequent nine months after the Berlin Wall fell, in, in my view, having spent years working on this book, uh, was the signature accomplishment of his diplomacy, which was to uh, put together the framework by which the remarkable reunification of Germany occurred in just nine months after the historic but also unexpected un, uh, fall of the Berlin Wall. At that time, there was no off-the-shelf playbook for this. Uh, not only was it a surprise, as I mentioned, uh, to the experts at the State Department, but uh, you know nobody had any plan for this. And because it was a revolutionary moment, you had governments falling all around in, in Romania and uh, not just in Germany. The Velvet Revolution had, was just occurring simultaneously in Prague. Uh, 
And, uh, you know, Baker uh, really seized the moment. It was probably uh, both his boldest act as a diplomat and one that required all of the skills that we've talked about so far. Uh, you know, he had enormous obstacles and it wasn't just the Soviets who were wary of giving away uh, this and having East Germany because Baker and Bush were insistent that uh, this new reunified Germany would be firmly anchored in the West, uh, that it would be a member of NATO, that it would be, uh, you know, a countervailing force immediately right in the center of Europe uh, to the Soviet Union and to the Warsaw Pact, which still existed at this time, by the way. Uh, and Margaret Thatcher was against it. Francois Mitterrand was against it. Why? Because they fought two terrible world wars against uh, Germany in the, in the not so distant past. Uh, inside West Germany itself, uh, Chancellor Kohl, widely and correctly seen in many ways as the, you know, the, the person who midwife uh, this unification, he wasn't even on speaking terms for much of the time with the West German foreign minister from a different party. Jim Baker had to act as the envoy between these two, uh, as, as much as he had to act as the envoy with the Soviets. Back in Washington, the hardliners at the Pentagon were skeptical, and even Bush and Scowcroft we're concerned at various points that Baker was moving too quickly. So I just, I think it's important for people to recognize, I, I certainly uh, realized how much I had taken this for granted and that, you know, in hindsight, history looks a lot more inevitable than it did at the time. And, uh, you know, this deal, uh, which just had its 30th anniversary of the unification of Germany uh, uh, is something that, that really is probably one of the biggest accomplishments of American diplomacy in the post-Cold War era, I would say. I would add one quick thing as well. Remember that the, <laughs> uh, the Soviet Union falls on Christmas Day, 1991. And really, it's only, it's only six or seven months later that Baker is gone as Secretary of State. He's dragged back to the White House against his will to yeah. become the White House Chief of Staff to run Bush's uh, re-election campaign. So in that six or seven months, it was a lot, it's a lot to expect them to have formulated a, 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 you know, a, a new world order in effect for the next 30 years. Had they won a second term, it would have been interesting to see what they would have done. Would they have turned from crisis manager, right, from existential you know, threats to you know, a longer term construction effort and a new, uh, a new type of uh, world? That would have been interesting to see. Yeah, uh, well, it is interesting. And um, uh, you know, it seemed that one of the things that they were very focused on during this moment was uh, arms control, trying to be able to um, uh, have an effect on some of the military capacities of, uh, of the former Soviet Union and, and uh, Eastern Europe, as opposed to how do you rebuild these structures. But, but Susan, I want to address this because it really was such a pivotal moment in our history, and it really set off uh, all of these other um, events that we saw, including the eventual dissolution of the Soviet Union, what happened in Germany. And it was just remarkable in that it was conducted without any bloodshed, with, with a little bit of exception in Romania, of course. I, I covered all of those with the exception of Poland um, and uh, was on the ground for every one of these uh, moments. Um, so, uh, but, but what it seems the difference is, you know, so when we think about China, as we've discussed, and we think about the Soviet Union, those were both big powers with amazing capacities. And when you think about Germany and, and Central Europe, while while in fact it was an important function and it was the fulcrum on which the Cold War really uh, balanced, uh, those weren't superpowers and they weren't sort of, they weren't in possession of nuclear weapons, for example, or any other types of things. So, so that's one factor that I think is different in, in the way that we look at that period and the way that they dealt with, uh, uh, that Baker and Bush dealt with foreign policy. But the second was that despite the tensions between Genscher and um, Kohl, um, Genscher never really had a popular base. And Kohl was really this very affable and, and big, larger than life leader who really had a vision of what a reunified Germany would look like. He, he would always talk about this. And this is planned for many, many years in his mind, what, we, what do we do with the German question? And so while the, what was happening in China may, may have been unpredictable, what happened in the Soviet Union was certainly dynamic and uncertain, the, the groundwork had been laid, at least as far as Germany was concerned, in terms of how to unify those. And then here steps in this very capable, um, uh, just amazingly able, uh, negotiator, diplomat to manage this whole thing so that it does 
evolve, as you say, in this peaceful fashion and, and, uh, and did things like, as you mentioned in the book, turn what was considered a four plus two discussion dialogue, which meant the four powers that had been occupying Berlin for, to simplify, uh, and the two Germanys, and, and turning that on its head and making it acceptable to become what it was a two plus four, meaning that the Germans were in fact leading the dialogue and, uh, and the other four were a part of that discussion. It, it, is an, it, is a, it is a remarkable moment. And, uh, and I think you really manage uh, and, and give us great color within the book uh, of that moment. Um, but as I say, does he look back at that and say that in fact, it was the United States that was the key player in being able, or do you see it as Baker being the key player at being able to manage that, that transition? Or were there, uh, or would you give as Helmut Kohl does and as sometimes uh, others give uh, the Pope in Rome, uh, just as much credit for some of that evolution? Look, uh, it wasn't Jim Baker who made the Berlin Wall fall. It wasn't, uh, you know, it was Germans. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, they themselves who, you know, had the choice about how quickly to move. Uh, and it was Mikhail Gorbachev who chose not to launch a military invasion uh, to stop the tide when his predecessors in the Kremlin uh, had taken the exact opposite course when it came to Hungary in 1956 or uh, Czechoslovakia. So, uh, you know, there were many, many authors of uh, this remarkable period in history. It just so happened that Jim Baker and George H.W. Bush, uh, not only were two of them, uh, but had uh, uniquely important and strong hands to play in the midst of this. And, you know, I, again, the, the, the lack of inevitability, partially, I would say, uh, why I think it's so remarkable what Baker was able, able to pull off in a short period of time is not because others, uh, you know, weren't there to be persuaded, but the window of time uh, it turned out was very short. And, you know, Gorbachev, as I mentioned, was already uh, uh, really under siege from hardliners within, uh, you know, the, the Soviet government, in particular uh, in the power ministries and the uh, intelligence services, the KGB. Uh, and they ultimately, as, as everyone knows, did in fact launch a coup against Gorbachev. What if that had happened earlier? Uh, and then, of course, uh, there was Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, which happened only the following summer, as they were just putting the finishing touches on this German unification treaty. Imagine that that had happened just a few months earlier. Uh, and, you know, you can immediately begin to see how uh, the accident of history uh, and Baker's ability to seize it, and as you pointed out, his, his main diplomatic contribution was uh, this two plus four formulation and getting all of those six players not only to agree to it, it was a way really of making sure that the Soviets uh, didn't see themselves as having uh, an overly grand uh, role in all of this. And, you know, again, it wasn't just the Soviets who were skeptical of the outside powers, the victorious World War II powers. Uh, he knew that Cole was the great proponent uh, and would be architect of unification, but he needed to clear out the space for him uh, to be able to make that happen. And so, uh, you know, the timing when you think of all these events, uh, it really was a very, very short window to get it done. Right, and that really is the magic of someone like James Baker and really being unique and, and where individuals matter, where their experiences and their, and their unique abilities uh, can play a role in world history. And I think you point that out in this book. Um, I wanna just jump to, you know, because when we're talking about this period, it, you pointed out that there was tension within uh, Washington itself. And, and this is a tension that we often hear about, certainly out here in the West Coast, but we don't necessarily, uh, are able, we're not able to view it uh, up close as you have, but the tension between the National Security Advisor and a Secretary of State, and that was certainly the case between uh, Brent Scowcroft and James Baker. Is that a natural uh, sort of tension that will always exist? Uh, and, and is it something we should look forward to uh, in, the, uh, in a time when we have Tony Blinken and uh, Jake Sullivan? <laughs> well, look, there's a natural uh, dynamic that does seem to, to make it uh, uh, likely that a national security advisor and secretary of state will find themselves at odds at times. Look at the history. Look at Henry Kissinger and Bill Rogers, right? Kissinger ultimately pushes Rogers out altogether. A Secretary of State takes both jobs. That's the only time they had, the National Security Advisor and Secretary of State were always on the same page when Henry Kissinger held both jobs. 
but, but you also saw that with Cyrus Vance and his big uh, uh, Brzezinski. And you saw that with uh, multiple Reagan national security advisors and uh, the Secretary of State in that uh, time as well. With, with Baker and Scowcroft, they were probably as close as you ever seen a national security advisor and Secretary of State. They didn't always agree. From time to time, you know, Scowcroft actually took the more conservative position often at times, more skeptical of Baker's diplomacy and, the, and the, uh, more skeptical of Gorbachev, uh, more willing to use force in the Gulf, for instance, than Baker was. Uh, didn't really understand Baker's strategy on Germany at first, thought Germany, Baker was getting too far ahead of him. But broadly speaking, in the history of the National Security Council, they were as close as they got. They, Scowcroft came in from the beginning and said, look, I'm not going to ever go on TV and speak for the foreign policy of this country without clearing with you first. Scowcroft understood what was important. Eventually, they didn't even need to do that because they had each other's number pretty, uh, pretty good. Baker understood Scowcroft so well that he put Scowcroft's really good friend Larry Eagleburger in as his deputy secretary of state so that there would always be this cross-pollination and kept a representative of Scowcroft's NSC on his plane with him when he flew around the world. Again, there were moments of tension. There's one moment Richard Haas talks about. He, Richard Haas was Scowcroft's guy on the plane and Baker is sandbagged by some decision made back in Washington. He's mad at Haas and he says, I don't know why you have me on my plane if you're not gonna tell me about these things in advance while well, he's heading to Moscow. And Haas told us later he felt like he was gonna be thrown off the plane at 35,000 feet. So it's not that there weren't tensions, but really I think Baker and Sukhov were probably as close uh, as any people who've held those jobs, again, other than when Henry Kissinger held both of them. Mm-hmm. Lincoln Sullivan? Well, I think those two, by the way, are, are probably likely yeah. pretty close. They're, they're, I think they're very simpatico. They're, they're good personal friends as well as, uh, you know, veterans of the Obama administration together. They've had a real history together. So I actually think that among the many issues you might see in the Biden administration, that's probably less of, the, less of a risk there than most. And of course, the president himself has just an enormous experience in foreign affairs. So you have a, a triumvirate there that is quite aligned, much like Bush and I think eventually Baker when he uh, grew into the uh, foreign policy portfolio. Oh. I uh, do have a question here from uh, one of our viewers. James Baker is a prime example of a true public servant. Are there any public servants left in Washington today or has power and the kind of modern day cult of personality around a leader made a return to service in the interests of the nation impossible? Well, you know, public service is not a word that's been thrown about with great abandon in the last four years, I would say, in Washington. Uh, You know, there are a lot of structural changes uh, that have happened and, you know, many of the incentives of politics and in our government have changed pretty radically from the time uh, when Jim Baker was sort of at the heights of Washington in the 1980s. We talk about that political polarization uh, certainly uh, didn't uh, start with Donald Trump and it won't end with him either. Uh, it, you know, the dysfunction and gridlock uh, up on Capitol Hill uh, and its increasing inability uh, to pass bills or perhaps even lack of desire to do so uh, not only did not start with Trump, but in some ways that was the context in which Peter and I launched this book project seven years ago, which feels like uh, 12 or 24 uh, years ago. But, you know, back in the Obama era uh, was when we began working on this book. And even then, we saw it as uh, an opportunity to sort of contemplate, you know, what, what, what made Washington of the 80s and early 90s different uh, than the Washington of today? And, you know, where are some of the sources of this gridlock and dysfunction? So, you know, I, I wouldn't peg it directly to right now, but certainly uh, one of the things that is striking uh, is the evolution in the Republican Party. Uh, and it's, it's, it's very radically different view, not just of politics and scorched earth politics, which certainly existed back in the 1980s. This was not an era of uh, you know, bipartisan good feelings. And you know, Jim Baker uh, was certainly a practitioner of hardball politics and uh, you know, oversaw the 1988 campaign and uh, the Willie Horton ad and you know, essentially turning, and it wasn't just that, by the way, uh, you know, turning Michael Dukakis, a, a mild-mannered technocrat from Massachusetts, into a you know sort of pledge of allegiance-hating, flag-burning, uh, ACLU card-carrying anti-American. So, um, you know, the difference was that in the odd-numbered years, Baker uh, not only found a way to work with adversaries across the aisle, Democrats or Soviets, uh, as the case may be. Uh, but he saw that as the job. He saw also the politics, the campaigning as the means to an end, the end being getting things done uh, and working on behalf of the American people in a way that's a much more traditional view of public service. Right now, uh, you know, you sort of see this sort of endless posturing and campaigning 
uh, almost as the end in and of itself to much of our politics. And, and I think that's, we can talk at a different time about all the reasons for it, but you know, for Peter and I, both of us have spent most of our careers here in Washington as journalists, with the exception of our time in the former Soviet Union and in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. And that's the biggest difference, you know, that we observe, uh, you know, it's just not only the failure to get things done, uh, but just these people don't even seem to care that much about it. I mean, right now, uh, with 300,000 dead Americans, there has not been a COVID relief package passed by our government since April, even though they both claim, both the Republicans and the Democrats claim they're in favor of it. This is unconscionable. And it is, I, you know, I like to think that if there was a Jim Baker around, uh, that wouldn't have happened and he'd have found a way to make a deal. Well, I, you know, I, we have uh, come to the end of this hour and it's just such a great way to wrap this up. I, I would just say uh, that one of the things that came across uh, as I was reading your book is the focus on Jim Baker and power, your study on power, and secondly, uh, his focus on winning. And um, it seemed that that was paramount, is that um, the maintenance and, and uh, achieving of power was really important and that winning was the way you got there. And if there's any parallel that uh, runs between his uh, approach, his belief, and uh, Donald Trump, it's in that very simple phrase of, it's all about winning. Uh, did you uh, think about, or have you uh, come to any conclusions regarding his uh, attitude towards winning? Yeah, I, I, you're right. He's super competitive. That's where he and George Bush ha found so much common ground, right? When they were tennis partners in the Houston Country Club, they were fiercely competitive. They both, to the end of their lives, would tell you about the two doubles tournaments that they won uh, at that country club way, way back in the day. But to them, winning wasn't just winning the election, right? And it wasn't just winning as in overpowering somebody else. That's the difference. Trump's definition of winning is, is putting somebody else down, you know, rising himself up at somebody else's expense. It's a very zero-sum definition of winning. Baker's idea of winning once you're in office, as Susan said, was getting stuff done was walking away from the table with something in hand. And winning to him meant the other side had to think that they were winning as well. That he did believe in the win-win, which has gone out of favor in Washington. The compromise was a good thing back then, not a dirty word the way it is today. So winning for him was getting a deal on Social Security, getting a deal on rewriting the tax code, getting a deal to make the Contra War go away, getting deals on arms control, and trying to get a deal on Middle East peace and so forth. And I, I think it's a very different kind of winning than we see today in Washington, where the very idea of working with the other side, not just because of Trump, but throughout, suffused throughout Washington today, is seen as a, a liability rather than a strength. Well, thank you for that coda. And thank you, Peter Baker and Susan Glasser. We're honored that you could join us today. Uh, to those of you who listened in today, thank you. And we hope you enjoyed today's program. To learn more, we encourage you to pick up their latest book, the Man Who Ran Washington, The Life and Times of James A. Baker III. This is World Affairs' last program in 2020. Uh, check in after the holidays to see what programs we have in store for 2021. For the time being, enjoy your holidays, and we hope you stay safe and healthy. We're looking forward to seeing you in the new year. And thank you, Peter and Susan, for joining us today. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. We love being with you guys. Thank you.